We're going to get started because uh, we have a lot to cover and it's a retreat Sunday. So you get to do some quiet time today and, um, and you'll probably want it after we go through some of this Bible prophecy stuff. I'm going to pray in just a second, but a couple quick announcements. This Wednesday is Live at the Loft for Christmas for middle school and high school. So the place will hopefully be crowded. So get here on time. And uh, December 9th will be your serving Saturday. Uh, the sign up deadline is today. So please make sure uh, if you haven't signed up to do that, if you want to serve this Saturday. And then also if you'd like a Christmas Fiesta Walking Taco on the uh, Wednesday of December 13th, you need to place that order today so that we can order the right amount of food. Walking Tacos, I don't know if you've ever had those, but they're super good if you like Doritos. And Paul and his team do a great job of that. Um, so make sure you sign up for that. And then also this Thursday... Um, December 7th at 6 p.m., ChillFest registration opens. So put, your, put an alarm on your phone or whatever it is you need to do to remind yourself because if uh, it goes like last year, it will be filled by the end of that day. Um, if you want to go, we've got some cool stuff planned to go up north and uh, we'll see what happens. It'll be a good time. And then lastly, um, this Wednesday is the, the Live at the Loft, last one of the year to close the Happiness Series. And the following Wednesday will be our Christmas Fiesta Explosion. Uh, party. We'll have a great time. It'll be a good time to just celebrate, and you also get some D-group time to close out the year. Also, due Sunday, December 10th, which is coming up, about one week from today, Ecuador applications are, are due, and uh, if you haven't received the stuff, you can look at, it's all online, but you can also get a hard copy on the table outside in the lobby. Um, and then lastly, Saturday, December 16th, Ebenezer Stone, there's a serving event you can sign up for if you would like to be a part of that. High school is getting that opportunity, middle school is not. Uh, you guys will do a great job with that. And before we begin, before I pray, would you guys give a round of applause to Aaron and his team for the great job they did on the Christmas decorations. It's so beautiful. They did a great job. And also thanks to Aaron who taught two Sundays ago and I know did a great job and uh, appreciate him and all that he does. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew 24. Otherwise, hopefully you have your notes. You should have the handout for the notes as well as a handout for um, the retreat Sunday that we're going to go through. And uh, there's a bunch of stuff that we're going to cover today that I hope will be an encouragement to you. I taught with uh, middle school earlier, and so um, I was trying to temper it in a way that didn't overwhelm middle school because part of what we talk about today can be overwhelming. My goal is not to overwhelm you. My goal is simply to teach you the truth and what the Bible says about um, end times because the Bible has a lot to say about it and I'm going to give you some object lessons and all kinds of stuff today that I pray will be an encouragement to you. So I ask that you give me your full attention. Middle school did a really good job. I'm going to walk through some stuff, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. Um, you can soak it in, write notes, and then you're going to get your quiet time. The leaders can go do their thing with their uh, leadership teams, and you guys get to spread out in this space um, to enjoy some quiet time as we'll close in prayer when the whole thing is done, uh, that God would use our life to multiply uh, his love in the people. So I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll see what God does. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the students here. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the leaders. Lord, I pray you give me strength to uh, give this message in a way that's faithful to your word, that encourages us and equips us, uh, because, Lord, there's stuff happening right now in the world that we need to pay attention to, and I pray that it wakes us up to the reality that uh, we, we have a responsibility to share your love with people in ways that I pray changes us, but also changes them. Help us to learn from Matthew 24 and 25 in ways that cause us to uh, represent you well. And if there are people here today that have never really asked you, Jesus, to be their Savior, pray that maybe after today's message they say, I want in. I want to be in the family. Enough playing around with my faith. I'm actually going to commit to the faith and uh, accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray that you would do that through the power of your Holy Spirit, not through me or any of us, but just simply calling people to a love relationship that changes every other relationship in ways that bring you glory. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. All right, so what you have in front of you is your notes. Uh, the front page is basically, we're at 30, but next week you're going to get even more fulfillments. We're going to get close to 40 next week of fulfillments of the Messiah being a, sp a specific person and a certain set of attributes and things that happen that he fulfills from the Old Testament into the New Testament recorded in Matthew. In Matthew 24, as you see at the bottom of your notes on the page, you'll see that in chapter 24, 1 through 35, 
Jesus talks about the signs of the end of the age. That's why we're talking about Bible prophecy today. And the day and the hour unknown, 36 through 51. Then we're going to transition to 25 where it's a little bit more lighthearted, but it's certainly in your face in a way that causes all of us to pay attention. Where am I in the story? What am I doing with my life? And so we'll end on a little bit more positive note, but on the front end, it's going to be a little intense because parts of this are intense. But before we get to the details of it, um, if you know your Bible, you can write in the margin of your notes. Um, actually, flip the page over to page 131. And on page 131, you will see that I've given you several verses, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, 1 Thessalonians 4, and Revelation 6. These are a couple of different sections of Scripture that speak to the area that we're going to talk about today in ways that I pray encourage you. As I said to middle school, the goal of what I'm going to say today is not to freak you out, but I do need to tell you the truth. And part of the truth does freak people out. It freaks me out. But hopefully at the end of this, you are more attentive to what's happening in the world and what's happening in your own life. And I pray that it encourages you and fires you up, doesn't scare you, all right? But here's what I want you to understand before I get to uh, the specifics of your notes, and we have 24 read to us in a little bit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15c through 17, I've quoted, to you, uh, quoted that verse to you multiple times. It basically summarizes the reason the Bible was written. It says, the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The purpose of the Bible is that, to have you recognize that God created us, but we have sinned against him, and he sent to Savior, his son, to set us free. Wise is the life that receives him. Once you receive him, you come to understand the very next line in verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants to equip your life to multiply. How do you do that? You let this book study you and you study it. And as you do that, you'll avoid some of the tricks and traps that the world is putting in your path on a daily basis. However, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15c through 17 is one of the most important sections of the Bible, but interestingly enough, the first part of that chapter in chapter, five, um, chapter 3, 1 through 5, this is what it says, and it relates to what we're about to talk about. It says, but mark this, these, there will be terrible times in the last days. This is basically talking about what we're going to study in Matthew 24. People will be lovers of themselves. Do you know that you're the most photographed generation in the history of the world? Do you know your grandparents, especially your great-grandparents, your great-grandparents would be lucky to have one photo of themselves? Maybe two or three. Your generation, you could have 30 just today. We are a generation that loves ourselves, almost to an unhealthy level. Well, I would say to an unhealthy level. So it says, mark this, in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. I think that's a very easy thing to prove in today's culture in a way that didn't even exist 10, 20 years ago. And now it exists multiplying. It says they'll be lovers of money. They'll be boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, Verse 4, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them, Paul says. It's a list of 18 to 20 things that are not something to brag about. Hey, our culture is really good at loving ourselves and loving money and disobeying our parents and all the other things that go with it. But when you start seeing all of that, the Bible says, mark this. These will be the mark of the last days. I'm going to give you some stuff that blows that out of the water today related to last days, so I hope you can pay attention to some of the stuff we're going to go through. For the sake of time, I want you to see this. Um, they're going to put it up here because it's easier, and plus we're blessed to have a really big screen. Isn't that cool? This is what we've gone through. I did not give you in the notes because I've given it to you several times over the course of years. But this is essentially what the Bible teaches all the way back here in Genesis, when Adam and Eve are created, God creates the heavens and the earth like we've talked about in our happiness series. You go all the way over here to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You eventually get to Moses and the prophets and all that goes on here, which eventually leads you to 
All these different prophecies that happen, some of which I've listed in your notes, that tell you what the Messiah is going to look like, and then all of a sudden the Messiah comes. I'm going to give you some math stuff from Daniel in a little bit related to that. But when the Messiah comes, he comes, and once he dies for our sins and sets us free for those who trust in him, this is the next age that we're currently living in. It's called the age of grace. It's called the church age. All of this has already happened, and prophecies have been fulfilled, as I'm going to share with you in a little bit. But in the age of grace, there will come a time when he basically says, the last days are here in the end times, and when the end times happen, he's going to rapture up his church, so those who believe in Christ have nothing to fear in Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is about this section, the tribulation, when the world will deal with unbelievable, um, unprecedented challenges with earthquakes, famines, desolation, wars, rumors of wars, all of these things. That will all happen in Matthew 24 is partly what is talked about, as we're going to get to in a little bit. When that segment's over, like we taught in this summer in Revelation, there'll come a time when that comes to an end and Christ and his church will come back and essentially re uh, rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. It's what Revelation teaches. Once that happens, because there are people who are born during the tribulation and they also will rule and reign with the millennial kingdom, there will come a point where there are people who also rebel against Christ again, even in that time, as Revelation teaches. And so what ends up happening is there's going to be essentially the big battle of Armageddon in this section, and essentially the, at the very end of uh, humanity, so to speak, you'll have the white throne judgment where people will go if you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, and God gives you what you want. You essentially go um, here to the lake of fire, hell. But if you've trusted Christ, you get to go to the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity, as it says in Revelation 20 and 22. I say all of that to you for this reason. This is a global map, and some of the stuff I'm going to go through with you today all relates to this little country here, Israel, which is an unbelievable country that it's even still here. It proves that God has power to protect his people because they're surrounded. I was just in this area uh, in April, and when I was here, right in this area is Megiddo, which is basically the, the battlefield for Armageddon. And Napoleon called it the battlefield of battlefields because it's one of the most unbelievable stretches of land that's completely flat while it's also surrounded by mountains. It's an absolute gorgeous space, all right? But when you're there, you can also basically throw a stone to Syria and Jordan, these countries that would love to take Israel out. So it's kind of fascinating when you're there. But what you're going to hear a little bit later today in the, in the prophecies, there's some stuff that's um, prophesied in Daniel and in Revelation and in some other books that there's going to be a day when this country is going to be surrounded by all kinds of armies and there's going to be stuff that happens and there's going to be a group that comes from the north. Look what's happening right now with Russia. Russia's been assembling all kinds of stuff that comes down to take over certain sections and they're coming from the north. That's right out of the Bible. There's going to be stuff that happens in the east. Does it sound familiar? China's doing some stuff right now. They're coming from the east, and they all want a piece of this land. It's forecasted hundreds and thousands of years ago, but it's happening. And so wise is the life that listens to what we're about to go through today, because if you listen, this little section here is, is the... Um, the last part right here, this is where Megiddo and all this stuff is up here. Here's Syria, here's Lebanon. We talked about this earlier when Jesus did the Sea of Galilee, Sermon on the Mount, all that kind of fun stuff. But this is to kind of remind you of where we've been. Prophecy is explaining history before it happens. Who can do that? God, because he knows the whole script. He knows the whole parade. He knows what, what's going to come here, here, and here. And so he predicts some stuff in the book of Daniel that if we go to the book of Daniel, this was basically his timeline, okay? And in the book of Daniel, he wrote all of these different things. And if you look at the dates, I put all this in your notes that we went through earlier. What ends up happening is, if you go back to here, you see the, the Babylonian Empire. The Medes and the Persians are up in this area. And so this is during Daniel's time. Babylon basically did have the dynasty at the time when this was written. Because Daniel was one of the people that got exiled, okay? He's part of the gold. 
But then he also wrote about a silver age where the Medes and the Persians would come in and completely take out the Babylonians. They did. So that was this time during these dates. And then he said, hey, guess what? There's going to be another group called the Greeks and the Romans, Alexander the Great that you study in your, stu uh, your history stuff in school. That's in the Bronze Age where they took out the Medes and the Persians at this particular time. And then, hey, guess what? There's going to be another group that comes in called the Roman Empire, which is down here. And they're going to take over the Greeks and the Romans, or the Greeks, Alexander the Great. And basically, you have the Roman Empire. The only empire that hasn't been fulfilled yet is this bottom one. And it's the one that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 and other places. And so here's what's interesting when you put all this together. This stuff was all forecasted well before it even happened. So this is going to happen. The New World Order and all the stuff that you read about in Scripture and you see in some phase of society. And I want you to be aware because here's what's interesting. And again, I don't have time to get into this, but I shared this with you when we went through the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, there's 70 weeks. He says there's going to be 70 weeks. And when you do the 70 weeks and you do the math, again, I don't have time to go through all this. I did it when we did Daniel. But basically, Nehemiah says, hey, the new wall is built. The people of Jerusalem, people, the Jews are back in Israel. We're good. That basically started the clock. That started the clock that the people of Israel were back together as a family. And because they're back together as a family, the clock started on March 5th, 444 B.C. When you do the math on all of that, it comes to this number of days, which basically says when this number of days hits, guess what will happen? A Messiah will show up. And guess what? He did. And so Daniel predicted mathematically from the 70 weeks, 69 weeks, when the 69th week hits, that's when the Messiah will show up. And he did. What we've been waiting for is the 70th week of Daniel that has basically been prolonged in the church age, the age of grace, what I just showed you in the diagram. And so this last part that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 is basically the culmination of what's going to happen at the end times and the tribulation. All of that to say, some of this, as you're going to find out, did occur in, in the lifetime of the disciples. He's going to talk about the abomination and all this different stuff that happens. These things, interestingly enough, that I've already touched on a little bit, you've read in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a place called Gog and Magog Wars. Gog is a man, Magog is a land. So there's going to be a, a man that comes in and tries to take over Israel called the Antichrist, essentially, at some point, And there's going to be the, the consecration of the land. So basically in 38 and 39, there's some sections where it says there's going to be armies from the north. Many people think that could be Russia and armies from the east. When the Euphrates River dries up, that will come, it'll allow uh, them to basically march from the east. A lot of different things are happening. I don't have time to get into all of it. But these are some of the fulfillments, if I have time, I'll come back to, um, that have already happened because the next time clock that they say um, started the clock is when Israel big, declared its independence on May 14th, 1948, the beginning of the generation of what they believe could be end times. And what happens is, if that's true, a generation is 75 to 80 years. Do your math. 1948 to right now. You could literally be living in the last days, according to people who've studied this more than I have. Could it happen? I don't know. Will it happen at some point? Yes, it will happen at some point. So we're going to go through some of that if we can. But here's what I want you to see before I let you listen to chapter 24. Today is the day I was, I was supposed to get assigned a, a particular assignment from Pastor um, Mike Pelzer. And it actually is funny because this was literally on my desk. And I thought, oh, what a great object lesson. I was going to be directing traffic if we had the fireworks today. But we can't have the fireworks today because it's been raining so long. And I was going to wear this cool outfit. I was actually going to get a cool wand, like a lightsaber, and I was going to have power. I was going to be like, hey, you get to park here, you get to park here, you can't park here. I'd love to harass you if you're parking alone. You can't park here. You park way over there. Whatever. I'd be nice to you. But nonetheless, I would sit here with this, and I'd be going like this, trying to get your attention. Here's what I want you to see. Look what it says up there. 318 times Scripture talks about Jesus' return. If you do the math on how many chapters in the Bible and all this stuff, it basically comes to Jesus' return. The theme of Jesus' return comes every 30 verses. Every 30 verses. 
So when people say, well, I don't know if it's a big deal to trust Christ as my Savior. I don't know if it's a big deal to be ready for heaven and all this kind of stuff. It is a big deal because God has basically said, I'm going to remind you every 30 verses, I'm going to be flagging you down. Hey, he's going to return. Be ready. He's going to return. Be ready. So if you put that in miles, all right, if you were to drive to Madison, you would, too, you would see two people dressed like me. Hey, he's going to return. Be ready. Because it's about 75 miles to get to Madison from here. If you drove to Chicago, you'd have three signs. If you drove to Nashville, you'd have basically 19 signs. It's 500, what is it, 571 miles. If you drove to Orlando, Florida, which some of you have done for your family, you would see 41 people going like this on your way from here to Orlando for your family vacation. Jesus is going to return. Be ready. And if you're really foolish like me, when I was in college, I went with some friends of mine and we drove to Key West, Florida for spring break. Key West, Florida is the southernmost tip of the United States. You know how many miles that is? Just one way is 1,638 miles. Stupid idea to drive that far. Okay? If you drove that far on the way there, you would see 55 signs of people saying, hey, Jesus is coming, be ready. And I want you to understand when we have chapter 24 read to you it's a really important thing for you to understand that's why I'm going through this I'm not going through this to freak you out I'm just going through this because the Bible says this is what's going to happen and people say well I I don't I don't know I don't I don't think it's a big deal I don't think I need to do this my last little part related to this before we push play and get to some specifics if you actually put that into time on average you have a 16 hour day 16-hour day, if you were to put that into the markers of how often, you would see the sign four times a day if you did some of the math, which would come to about 195 times a year that God would say, I'm trying to get your attention. If it's 195 times a year times the average generation of your life is 75 years, after living for 75 years, you would have seen the sign 14,625 times. Hey, I love you. I'm trying to get your attention. And my pastor friends and I have been blessed to do many funerals for people who have lived a well-done, good and faithful servant life as we're about to study today. But I've also done some funerals for people who said after 14,600 invitations over the course of 75 plus years of life, they never accepted Jesus Christ. And it's a very hard funeral to do because there's no hope. There is only one plan. You get this one and only life to receive him or reject him. And that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 and 25. Wise is the life who listens. So when we put all that together, you're going to see Jesus basically start out the signs of the times, the ends of the age. I want you to hear this first section and I'm going to stop it. I'm going to go through a couple of key things. Um, and for the sake of time, here's your first fill in the blank because I'm going to be nice to you. Um, Oh yeah, we've talked about these things already that the very beginning of the book, just to set the stage, we're, we're now getting, we're turning the corner to the final chapters where it's a big deal. This is called the Mount of Olives. I put it in your notes. Why it's, it's called the Olivet Discourse to be fancy theologically, but it's just a fancy way of saying Jesus is hanging out in the Mount of Olives, which is just outside of Jerusalem. And he's telling his disciples, this is how it's going to end. This is how it's going to go down once I go down and die for your sins. Okay, so don't be, don't be freaking out. This is how it's going to happen. And so he goes through some stuff. But if you remember in the very beginning of our study here in Matthew 1, it highlighted Jesus as the king. We had the genealogy. He's basically, his name means savior. So how many signs does God have to give us? And then he talks about how we can worship him. In the middle of the book, we talked about life's greatest question. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Matthew, or, uh, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, and, and life's greatest answer, life's greatest example. God the Father says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him, exclamation point. And then Jesus says, life's greatest sacrifice. He says, I'm going to lay down my life for you. I'm going to die for your sins. It's greatest sacrifice. And then the greatest victory, he says, but on the third day I'll raise again, and history will be forever changed. And so he goes through all of this stuff. The Daniel's 70th week, this for, your first fill in the blank is this, the tribulation, seven years of God's wrath. You're not here for this if you trust Christ as your Savior. The part that you're having read to you, doesn't, you're not here for this. God's wrath is not on his children. 
because he has been, you've been saved from his wrath through his son, Jesus Christ, who took your wrath in, his, in your place, okay? And so the church is going to be raptured, which is why I showed you the diagram, and this is Daniel's 70th week. This is when the tribulation happens, and in Revelation 6 through 19, we spoke of this this past summer. And so it basically lays out the beginning of the end, the true end, as we understand it in this course of history. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to have them push play, and you're going to hear the first, uh, about the first 21 or so verses. Enjoy. Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At right. that so just this section, just for the sake of time, you'll see under verse 2 on page 133, um, if you look above in verse 1, the temple that Herod had started, Herod the Great, started in 20 BC. They were still building that building. The majesty of that building was significant. And so for Jesus to say to his disciples that not one of these stones in verse 2 will be left on another had to be just a mind scramble for them. They had to be like, there's just no way. There's just no way that could happen. Similarly, New Yorkers, back when they made the Twin Towers, they thought, man, those things are going to be up forever. Those things are going to be there. And in a matter of time, on September 11th, in a matter of minutes, those two humongous towers fell to the ground, and basically the United States was called into attention. And so it's interesting how we think certain things are indestructible. God says, hey, this is one of the signs that you can look for. This is what's going to happen. And so what ends up happening is you see in your notes under 2.1, under verse 2, that this was fulfilled in A.D. 70. So within the disciples' lifetime, this actually happened. Some of this stuff didn't happen in their lifetime. This actually did happen. The stones were turned over and the, the temple was destroyed by Rome in A.D. 70, just as Jesus said it would happen. He says in verse 3, um, when this happens, you will see the sign of the coming, the end of the age. Basically, there's markers. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes and famines in verse 7. Go to page 134. And he says, the people will hate people who are Christians, who are followers of Christ. In verse 9, they will be hated by all nations. Why? Because of him. You trust him, people will not like the fact that you've trusted him. And so you'll see all of this um, situation develop. There's stuff in the Great Tribulation on page 134 in the middle. You can look at it on your own time. But you go to uh, page 135, verse 21. 
You'll see that for there, the great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Again, the tribulation, as we talked about in Revelation, is a time you don't want to be here. Because here's one of the things you have to understand. One of the reasons that there's not unbelievable wrath of God, which would be completely justified, because if you've ever been blessed to have your own room, you're blessed to have your own room. Imagine people just coming into your room and destroying it every day. Would you have every right to be upset? It's your stuff. But people come in, trash it every single day. I promise you, when you get in college, you'll experience this. You'll have your own room or you'll have your own apartment. You'll have some stuff and some people come by. People might have a party and you don't even want the party, <coughs> but they trash your place. And it happens again and 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 again. Would you be justified to drop the hammer and say, guess what? This isn't your property. This isn't your stuff. I'm done. But here's what God does. He patiently waits because he doesn't want to uproot his church. He's going to protect his children. So that's why the rapture happens, because before he drops the hammer, he's going to take his children and say, here, you come over here. Sit right here. You'll be safe. Because I'm about to drop the hammer on my creation that has disobeyed me for thousands of years. Is he justified? Absolutely. And so this part talks about it, and it'll, it'll come to a point in verse 29 where the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Basically, he's going to start to recreate his world for a new world, a new heaven, and a new earth. If you go to page 136 for the last little part here before we transition, he says essentially, Verse 30, then it will appear a sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then the people of earth will be mourned, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. And a loud trumpet call, verse 31, and he will gather the elect from the four winds and the ends of the heavens to the other. Essentially, God will one day gather his church, and one day he will gather all of his children after the tribulation, because some people will trust Christ during the tribulation. There'll be Jewish missionaries, the 144,000 who will go out and basically be protected by the Lord, but some of them will go and reach people for Christ, and that's why the millennial kingdom happens that we talked about. Okay? For the sake of time, I don't have time to get into it, but it's interesting. In 1900s, early 1900s, someone who was studying this said, hey, Jesus can't return yet because everybody can't see him when he returns. And people are like laughing at him like, yeah, that's not true because God can do whatever he wants. But it is interesting in today's world that about out of the population of 8 billion people, about 6.5 billion people have one of these. And it's interesting that in this time in history, if something happens globally, you can actually know about it within a matter of minutes. Something could happen around the other side of the world, and literally you can know what happened, because it could go viral that fast. It's interesting. I don't, I'm not saying that it could happen, but it's interesting that this could be a tool that teaches people, oh my goodness, he's back. And he's saying to the church, come with me. Just come with me because I'm about to drop the hammer, and eventually he will drop the hammer. When all this comes together, verse 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And then here's your next fill in the blank for the sake of time. The truth about time, only the Father knows. How do we know that? It's verse 36. People have asked me, hey, pastor, when will Jesus return? He said, I've, my answer has been, only the Father knows. What Jesus has said, and he says it here, and he says it elsewhere, just be ready, be prepared. So we're going to find out at the end of today's message, okay? Verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, meaning Jesus, but only the Father. That's a big deal. And so when you see that specific teaching, you need to keep watch. The Bible says in verse 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day on which the Lord will come. And that's why Jesus gives the example of, hey, if you knew the day that the, God, the robber was going to come in and rob your stuff, wouldn't you be ready? But because you don't know the day and you don't know the hour, just be ready. And so Jesus says the same about his return. And so when you put all this together, he gives us one last little illustration before we transition to a little bit more uplifting stuff in 25, is this idea of, he, he, he says he'll put uh, in charge his servants, okay, meaning his, his servants in terms of Christendom. 
And it's, if you look at the bottom of your notes on page 137, if a, if a master or a Jewish person at that time in history had a lot of possessions, land and goods and stuff, and he wanted to go away for a couple days, you know what he would do? He would say to one of his servants, hey, you're going to be in charge of all the property. Why is the servant that when the master comes back, he's doing what the master wanted him to do? But if you didn't do that, and you're like, hey, now I got some power. I'm the, the master's away. I'm the servant, and you guys are going to do what I tell you because I'm the head of the house right now. And the master comes back and sees that you're abusing people. You're doing the wrong stuff. The master says, get away. And that's what he says here. Get away in verse 54. You hypocrite. Go where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You weren't part of the, You didn't understand what I asked you to do. And so there's this part that Jesus sets the stage, as he's about to do even more so in the parable of the ten virgins. He basically says, it's not about sitting here and knowing the day and the hour exactly. It's about just being prepared. Just be prepared that he's ready. If he comes today, he'd be so proud of you for being in the church and actually studying his word. I know many of your peers don't choose to come to church. That's why I'm so proud of you. You could be a lot of other places right now, but you're here. And so I'm proud of you for that. But here's the deal. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're in Christ. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're living for him. And so Jesus transitions in, in Matthew 25 as he does the Olivet Discourse. He's like, hey guys, there's going to be a tribulation. You're not going to be here for part of that tribulation, but there will be people who will be missionaries in that tribulation. They're going to have to go through a lot of stuff. But when that tribulation's over... There's going to be a celebration as we study in a couple of weeks, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, okay? When we get to that part, here's my last little part before we transition, okay? Interestingly enough, there's been books written about this topic that we've just studied. There's a whole series called Left Behind. It was a huge thing uh, years ago. People read all of these books. They were biblically based for the most part. There was even some movies put together. And basically what the movies were showing and the books were showing is that, hey, there's all of a sudden when Jesus raptures his church, there'll be people missing from planes. There'll be drive cars that have no driver. There'll be people missing from college campuses, from classrooms and high schools, and people in their homes, their families, some of whom got teased for going to church and being a Christian. All of a sudden, the Bible says that they're going to be raptured and the family's like, where's mom? Where's my brother? Where are all my people from my class? Where are some of the people from my team? They're gone. They're not coming back. They're gone. And that's one of the reasons there'll be more destruction and devastation because God's protection is no longer here in the way that it was for his church. He took his children out, and now he can drop the hammer. His children are protected, and the people who are over here that maybe got teased for going to the loft or teased for going to the church or reading their Bible, they're feeling pretty good right now. They're eternally secure through the blood of Christ. This was written by a guy I respect greatly, Josh McDowell. And he titled the book, The Last Christian Generation, The Crisis is Real, The Responsibility is Ours. He saw the decline of the Christian church decades before other people did. I'm well aware that the Christian church is dwindling. It's growing in parts and it's dwindling in many. You know why? Because the Bible said it would happen. People will grow cold when wickedness increases, they'll grow cold to the truth. You see it in media, you see it all over the place. And here's what's interesting. When you put all this together, for the sake of time, I don't have time to get into it, but this is a book I've enjoyed for years. It's called Margin. It's, one of the, it's written by a doctor in Wisconsin, and he basically says one of the reasons people are unhealthy is because they have no margin in their life. They have no margin for spiritual growth. They have no margin for relationships. They have no margin in their finances. And they wonder why they're completely spread out and stretched out and stressed out. So he gives some solutions and prescriptions. But interestingly enough, he puts some stuff in the back of the book that I can't show you because it's too small for you to see. But he basically says some things that I'm about to share before we close to go to 25. He says, in the course of history, charts went like this. They went like this, and then all of a sudden they've spiked. If you actually watch the, the cost of college education, it used to be fairly manageable, and then it spiked, like unbelievable. 
Same with houses, same with all kinds of different things. And he basically says in here something that actually Daniel prophesied about in Matthew tw- or Daniel 12 when he talks about the end times. In the end times, he says a phrase in there where he basically says in the end times, there'll be people, increase of people going to and fro, and there'll be an increase of knowledge. Here's what's interesting. Back in the day, not that long ago, you will see that there's basically rest areas or what we would now call gas stations every 30 miles. You know why that is? When people traveled by horse, a horse can go about 20, 30 miles before they need a rest. So you'd have all of these rest spots in travels of of different places. But when we got to the point where we could have cars and buses, guess what? You could travel now 50, 100, 200 miles in a day. You could increase your travel. And then not too much longer, air travel got much better where you could literally go wake up in the morning in Wisconsin and land at the end of the day in Israel on the other side of the world, same day. Travel's increased at a level that is unbelievable. Take that also in the area of knowledge, that not only will travel increase in the end times and last days, so will knowledge. Did you know that knowledge basically, prior to the 1900s and the Industrial Revolution, knowledge would double about every 200 years. Now they estimate, because of the different inventions that have happened, knowledge actually increases, every they believe, every two months. They say that there are people, and I, I'm, I can't get on this bandwagon necessarily, but I am nervous like a lot of other people, that if this increase in travel is part of the end times, and that the increase in knowledge is part of the end times, what's interesting is that People think that the invention of AI essentially being developed in the year of 2023 is an invention higher than the wheel and higher than fire. Because for the first time in history, if it actually develops in the way that they think it will develop and has self-awareness, for the first time in human history, we will not be the smartest people on the planet. Nor will we have control. And so when you put it all together... The increase of travel, the increase of knowledge, the increase of wickedness, you put together the prophecies that have been fulfilled, there are a lot of people that are really nervous about this particular time in history. Why? Because they believe, if I can go back to it really quickly, they believe when you look at this chart, There are people who believe that when Israel effectually became an independent nation in 1914, 1948, when that happened, it started the clock like Nehemiah in 44, 444 BC. That essentially God's people were in this situation and they believe that all of this stuff, Jeremiah, these different things are fulfilled. And again, I don't have time to get into all of it, but these different things have been fulfilled in a way that is causing some people who've been studying this book for a long time be ready because he said he's going to come and the master says you want to be ready so here's your final little part and then we're going to let you go to your degree or your quiet time point number three be prepared or be locked out you'll see the parable of the ten virgins parable of the ten virgins and then you're going to see the parable of the talents and the sheep and the goats i'm going to go through this extremely quick so that you can have some quiet time but basically what this comes down to is this The parable of the ten virgins, we're going to play for you. It's only 13 verses, but pay attention to the part where it says there's a wise one and a foolish one. So enjoy this while I rest my voice for a second. Matthew 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. 
the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. All right, so when you see this, this is essentially be prepared is the main part. The foolish ones weren't prepared, and they were locked out. The wise ones were prepared. They had brought extra oil, and they were ready for him. Um, that's basically Jesus kind of saying to the audience that has ears to hear, be ready. The final part for the sake of time is the parable of the talents. And in this particular parable, I've got a little object lesson I'm going to show you in just a second, but I want to have it read to you as well, because in this particular area, it's one thing to get saved by his grace, but it's another thing to actually ask God to multiply your life. So here's your, your fourth um, fill in the blank. Be a multiplier of God's gifts, not a hider. Be a multiplier of God's gifts, not a hire. The hider was basically the one who got the one talent and he hid his gift. But the one who got the five talents and the two talents, they actually multiplied it. So enjoy hearing it read, and then I'll give you a little object lesson. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, so here's your object lesson for now. And it's the reality to set you up for your quiet time and retreat Sunday. The first person essentially got five talents. Second person got two talents. The third person got one talent. The idea behind this is simply it's a talent, it's a God-given ability that he gave you, and as you basically take the talent, the goal is to actually open up the talent and actually take the time to understand what is the mission for you specifically. And if you actually take the time to open up your specific mission and you tie it with this specific book and you ask the Holy Spirit, multiply my life, guess what? He will. He will. God wants to multiply your life. He wants you to make a difference. Once you get saved, you don't just sit there and hide. You actually say, God changed my life. I'm a broken person. I'm still struggling. I will still struggle. But Jesus says I'm loved. I'm forgiven. 
I've trusted him as my savior. And now if, if that's not even enough, he gives me a mission. And so what's interesting about the mission is if you actually do this, and I've seen this happen, busy people become more busy. You know why? Because they've been so faithful with what God's given them. God keeps giving them more. Here's another mission. They do the mission and they go and they multiply it. They multiply it to a point where God the Father eventually says, and it's not a proper example, but essentially God the Father says, all right, you've been faithful with this stuff. I'm going to give you more. And so he keeps putting more in this, just like he did for the guy. But then the guy who buried it, the guy who buried it, what did the text say? He blame shifted it on the master. He didn't own it himself, which is classic human nature. And God says, take away the one thing he did have and give it to someone who will multiply it. And the other thing that he could have had out of the jar, it ain't going in his jar. It's going in the other jars of people who will multiply it. So when you see people that are talented by the Lord and God's favor rests on them and they keep getting busier and they keep multiplying other stuff, it's because they're literally living the parable of the talents. God's multiplying their life. He's impacting people because their life wants to impact others. But if you sit here and say, I'm going to bury it, I'm just going to hide, God will take the one talent that you had and actually take it away. I've seen it happen. I've been working with your age bracket long enough, and I've seen with adults long enough that God keeps saying, hey, I gave you this talent, go use it. I gave you this talent, go use it. And they don't use it, they don't use it. And you know what God does? I'm going to give it to her. And then he doesn't want, I'm going to give it to him. He'll multiply it. He'll know it came from me. And so I just want to remind you, this illustration is a powerful one, because if you look at the notes, it's, there's two exclamation points. It says, well done, good and faithful servant, exclamation point. Come and share your master's happiness, exclamation point. Interestingly enough, both of them are rewarded the same. The two and the five. It's not about, well, hey, he's got this and she's got that or whatever it is. No. Whatever your assignment is, just be faithful in it and let God multiply your life. And he closes with this. This is just for the sake of time. Here's your final fill in the blank. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. It's basically what he says. At the end of time, when we get to the final map, the sheep will be put on his right, the goats will be put on his left. And essentially he says to the the sheep, you have been highly favored by my father, Take your inheritance, verse 34, and the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. It means the new heaven and the new earth. You're part of the protected family. They say, well, why is that? And verses 35 through 40 basically say why. Because when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. Short translation, you lived your faith. You actually lived your faith. But if you don't live your faith, What ends up happening is verse 41, depart from me, you who are cursed. He basically says, for when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. You basically lived a selfish life. He closes it with verse 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, the goats and the righteous, meaning the sheep, to eternal life. The emphasis of this entire section of scripture is to basically say to all of us, myself included, be prepared. Live your assignment. Take the time to actually open up the mission and ask God to multiply your life. That's what we're going to do in your quiet time right now. I want you to review. Hey, you wrote down some stuff on a sheet in the month of November when we did the retreat Sunday. How did you do? Did you achieve those things that God said, hey, let's work on this together? Because if you worked on that stuff in November, guess what you get to do in December? You get to build on that. But if you didn't build it in November, it has to go back to no- December because you're not you can't build the second floor till the first floor is done. God knows that. You should know that. So this discipline of being quiet before the Lord and resting in his word and teaching you to be prepared is an important one. And so here's how I want to close and then we're going to close in prayer. When you get to the core of all of this, it comes down to this particular illustration. Are you ready cuz he's given you the signs for years and years and years and I'm so proud of you for being here. But if you've never really trusted Jesus as your Savior, I would ask you to trust him today. 
And if not today, somewhere in the Christmas season, maybe on a Wednesday night Christmas show. I don't know when it is, and I'm not going to pressure you. But I have a responsibility to teach you the truth. And the truth says, Jesus says, he's coming back. All the other prophecies have been fulfilled. We're only waiting on a handful more. 30% of scripture is prophecy. All the other world religions, they don't have prophecy. Christianity is unique in that way. God calls his shot long before it happens, and many of those things have been fulfilled. We're just waiting on the last set, and I pray that you're prepared. Let's pray. Father, help us to know that if we're truly born again through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and we've asked Jesus Christ to be our Savior, today's message is actually exciting for us because we wait and long for the day we get to go home and be with you forever and not have to deal with all the stuff. But if there are people here today, Lord, that have come to church but never really crossed the line of faith, I pray that either today or sometime soon in this Christmas season, you bring to mind the scriptures that you want them to see and the things that you want them to understand that you truly have come to die for our sins and set us free. And only those who truly ask Jesus Christ to wash them of their sin and forgive them and allow them by the grace of God to be a part of the family are truly born again and truly saved. And we have peace because we're part of the family. We have nothing to fear. Father, I just want to thank you personally for that privilege that I don't wake up to fear every day. I wake up knowing I'm loved and that you want to multiply my life. I pray that each and every person here who hears this message wants to do the same. Know that they're loved and forgiven by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and that you, Holy Spirit, help us understand how we can multiply our life for the glory of Christ. Father, I also want to pray as we do this quiet time that your Holy Spirit would prompt us to recognize dreams and things you want us to pursue in this chapter of life so that we can continue to build what you want us to build and do what you want us to do in ways that show people that we love you and we seek to serve you by being intentional with our life, just as the parable of the talents talks about. You have to go. You have to be responsible. You can't just sit around. So help us, Lord, to figure out what those things are, and I pray that you get the glory for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Leaders, you can go and enjoy your time uh, together. Students, stay put here. Just You can spread out in this area, and we'll let you do your quiet time for the final uh, 15 minutes or so. As always, just enjoy some quiet time. You should have a sheet before you that you can write down some ideas, but enjoy your time, and we'll close in prayer.